All right. Well, welcome to week 12-ish. Um, today I'm covering triggers after fighting with a projector for 10 minutes. Um, today's lecture shouldn't be, the lecture part shouldn't be too, too long. There's going to be a demo like I did last week. Uh, that should go fairly quickly also. Um, now, as you can see, the screen so hopefully the slides look okay if not it's gonna look like crap and we're gonna live with it because we all are all adults okay for starters triggers triggers are event-driven actions and event-driven programming is something that you guys probably haven't been taught very much uh, have you guys played with jQuery at all jQuery UI, UI elements okay so if you've played with UE elements and you've experienced a bit of event-driven programming, event-driven programming was a buzzword in the 90s. That's when the first visual Windows tools came out for developing interactive interfaces. And by interactive interfaces, I'm talking, you know, the form have buttons and drop-downs. And for those of us that are old enough, we remember to call it something called Visual Basic. Uh, that was the shit in the day. Uh, Visual Basic 2 is what I learned on for event-driven programming. Uh, that doesn't age me at all. Um, but it was the introduction to event-driven programming. Now, what's happening by event-driven means that something happens and you respond in accordance. So for you guys who are used to think about event-driven such as somebody clicked on a button on my web page, somebody clicked on a link on my web page and something happened. You're responding to an event, thus event-driven programming. Now, that's fairly simple concepts. The problem you have with triggers, especially in a database, is not only is there an event, there's a point in time involved with it too. So that would mean that for any given event, there are six moments that can be captured total because of it. Uh, sort of like when you work with jQuery, you have, you know, key down, key up, key press, focus, blur, over. Those are all things. Those are events. Now imagine if each of those events you could capture before they press down on the key and after they press down on the key. So if you had a key press event, you could actually put in two different events based on before or after it happened. Whereas you guys are used to having a key, a key down, key up. You have the two. With database and trigger specifically, you have three common events at all database servers that support triggers support. Insert, update, and delete. Anything that modifies your data. And the catch is that there's also before and or after that event. So that means that you can, cap, you can cause an event to fire off before the insert and then after the insert. So you can have two different events, one before the insert happens, one after the insert happens. I've got a pretty little colorized flow chart at the end of the slideshow to help cover that a little bit better. Um, now, depending on what database server you're using, the trigger may or may not be part of a transaction block. And by that, I mean if you issue a begin transaction, then all the triggers will be captured as part of the transaction block. With a database server such as Postgres, even if you don't issue a transaction like a begin or a commit statement, if you don't issue the begin, um, the, tra the, the triggers are still part of the transaction. In other words, if you do an insert, it assumes that both triggers are part of it. MySQL, on the other hand, does not. That means that the before trigger can fire and then the actual event itself fail, but the before trigger is still fired. Unless you've issued the begin and, uh, begin and commit or begin and rollbacks. Um, unless they're part of a transaction block, explicitly they're not. All right. So, the trigger flow is a specific series that need to happen. The chart's on the next slide. Um, there's two data structures that may or may not be available depending on when something happens. Uh, the two data structures are called new and old. Now, you guys have probably experienced this with uh, C Sharp, where you've got objects and the objects have properties. Uh, Python 
similarly, you can have an, a class, and the class has properties and methods. Um, every time a trigger fires off, depending which kind of trigger it is, you'll have two data structures, one called new, one called old. The new contains the new data being pushed to the server. Old contains what was there before. And the new is available as part of the insert and part of the update. The old is part of the update and part of the delete. Um, that means that when you're inserting something, of course there's no old data because you're putting something in new. When you're doing a delete, there's no new data. You only have the old data that's being deleted. Uh, obviously, when you're doing an update, you have the data that was there before, and you got the data you're using to replace it. Therefore, you have new data and old data. So those are th the two objects. Those of you that have started doing lab 10 have already played with the old data object, where you're grabbing the old values. Um, and essentially, that's you know that's what it's for, is to grab the old values. Now I'll pull up the flow chart of the actual flow. And I used to draw this on the board, and I gave up. Um, it's probably almost unreadable at a distance. Uh, but the slide shows up on Canvas, so you should be able to at least look at it. All right, so upwards green. It says SQL command received. Actually, it's not bad. It's just two not-so-important things are up there. The first thing that the SQL server whether it's MySQL, the database server, um, does it looks and sees, is this a manipulation command? So is this an insert and update or delete? Yes or no? If it's no, it executes the query, and then it checks if it ran correctly. If it failed, it raises an error. Otherwise, it goes to the end, which is, of course, down here somewhere. Um, if it is a manipulation command, so that's an insert, update, or delete, it checks to see if the query is parsed OK, as in, you know when you guys do a build in C Sharp and then you have a syntax error and the compiler says <laughs> no? Well, believe it or not, most database engines have a compiler. It's an interpreter. It says you what it reads your command and it determines whether or not the syntax is correct. It won't determine whether or not it's right, but it'll check at least if the syntax is correct. So the syntax parser runs, checks to see if it's all good. If it is, it then does a little check, says, is there a before trigger? Can Is there a trigger that needs to be fired before we do the manipulation command? So do we need to fire something off before the update statement? If no, it runs the command, continues down the flowchart. If it needs to fire it off, it'll go yes. It executes the before trigger. Then it checks if it executed properly. If it doesn't, it raises an error because it blew up. If it does successfully execute, which I've got a box here, it's all twisted. Um, if it executes successfully, um, the trigger, it will then do the update statement. So it actually runs the update statement against the database. And if the update statement is good, it continues on. If it's bad, it fails. You guys are used to seeing failures coming out of that. So did it actually succeed, yes or no? If yes, it goes up. If not, it continues. I mean, if it failed, it goes up. If it succeeded, it continues. It checks if there's an after trigger. And if there is an after trigger, it executes it. If it succeeds, it goes on. And then it, it, it ends. Now, here's the catch with MySQL. You have triggers in your database, but you're not using transactions. So you didn't issue a begin command. So over here, way over here, you didn't issue a begin command. You just did update. And the update fires off a trigger. And it goes through and it fires off. It's good. It fires off the before trigger. Before trigger succeeds, gets to here, and this fails. So the actual update statement's wrong. Something's wrong. You're trying to shove uh, a bar car into a, an integer field, for example. So the, whole, the query fails. Now, what's bad about MySQL, right here, whatever happened here, if you're not in a transaction, continues to have happened. In other words, it's a bit like um, you wrote down on the piece of paper that you're about to do a job, 
And then on the way to getting there, you know, you get into an accident and your car breaks. You never made it to the job, but you said, oh, I'm going to do the job. Therefore, you never finish it, but, but the before trigger fired off, and it continued. That, it's as if it never it, it could happen, but the rest of it didn't. So it's uh, like half succeeding. Now, again, with MySQL, this is the before trigger works. The command is executed, and it succeeds, so the update statement works. And then the after trigger fails and blows up. Everything before this has happened. The data is committed to the database, but the after trigger fails. Everything else before it happened, if it's not part of a transaction block, which is why it's so important to use transactions on MySQL. You could have a trigger right here that cleans up your data or logs your information, and this one fails for whatever reason. The rest of it happened. And an error is raised, but the actual command actually succeeded. Anyways, you actually get an error back, but the update still succeeded. So at that point, you're in a sort of a race situation where something failed, you don't know what. Uh, but if it was part of a transaction block, you issued a begin command, and this failed, it rolls the whole thing back. Um, so that's what my, how MySQL behaves. Um, database servers like Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, Oracle, if any of these steps fail, the whole thing fails. So without issuing an explicit transaction, if any of this fails, the whole thing fails. Because it behaves in an isolated block by itself. All right. So the trigger syntax. Um, create trigger, you give it a name. Trigger time, trigger event on some table for each row. Trigger action, trigger action is code. Trigger time is either before or after. The trigger event is insert, delete, or update. Um, I got an example on the next slide. Now, something I've got to highlight, which is for each row. Heck, not having the white screen down actually is kind of handy. Okay, for each row, this block right here, this one's optional. For each row means for every row being affected by the by the, the query. That means if you do an update, something like All right, so I do update user set reset pass to true, and I've got 100 users. That means all 100 users is being affected. This means that for each row, when you, the trigger fires off, it's going to actually do each of these commands that are in here once for every row being affected. So it'll actually fire off the inner commands 100 times. As opposed to if you don't have for each row, it fires off the trigger once. So, for each row is used essentially for data manipulation purposes. If you don't have for each row, that's usually used for logging. You know, Dan triggered a mass update. Goes into a something somewhere. Um, the trigger action is code. Uh, just like the stuff you've been seeing for the functions and the procedures, the same syntax, same language. All behaves the same. It's all good. Um, going to erase this. So I'm about to bring up the next slide, and there's no point having this up here. Okay. Oh, good. It's not broken, display-wise. Okay. Here's a sample trigger. This one's a little more complex. Um, this one here is based on real-life experience. We had a case where we had someone hacking our database and we had to start logging serial number changes because we needed to know what they were doing and 
Um, essentially what this did is every time our serial number was successfully changed, it would log an entry. So here's the syntax. Delimiter, you guys are used to seeing that. Create trigger, there's the name. We're saying it happens after the update. On, that's the name of the table, so the table called products. Then it's for each row. As you can tell, it's not really important where you put all the keywords until you hit the word begin. Because it's SQL, you guys have learned, right? You can put it all on one line, break it out as many lines as you want. Then you got your begin block, and your end block with your you know, new and improved delimiter. So this is your standard definition. And the logic here is, if the old serial number is not equal to the new serial number, and this actually reads like English, pretty much. If the old serial number is not equal to the new serial number, then we're going to execute this code. This is here so that we don't log changes when the serial number does not change. So there could be a product for a customer that's changing because we're adding a little note to it. We're updating, you know, some options, something. We don't want to log every one of those entries. We just want when the serial number changes. So that means that the serial number has changed when the new one's not equal to the old one. We're doing an insert. And there's the old ID, the old name, blah, blah, blah. I'm entering now into the log date. And here for log type, entry updated, because you know I was putting a note. For those that have been working on Lab 10, this probably looks somewhat familiar. Because it's pretty much Lab 10 with different fields. So, you know, that's that one. Um, the other one that's important to know about is when you determine something is wrong, and of course now this is broken off to the side a little bit, so that's okay. Um, I'm going to create a trigger, and this one's a before delete. So, for example, I got a table called products log, and you don't want the average end user to be able to nuke the contents of your log. Why? because they can hide what they've been doing. Therefore, we don't want to allow deletes to happen, even if they have permission to delete. You, do, you, don't want, you want to say, no one shall delete anything from this table. So what's happening here is saying, oh, dude's going to fire off uh, a delete from the products log. I'm going to begin. Right now here, I'm firing off something called a signal. That's really weird syntax, and I really prefer uh, Oracle's and Postgres's syntax to, as opposed to this one. Um, signal SQL state 45,000. 45, That's an error message. 45,000. Why is it? I don't know. 45,000 is the one that tells it I'm about to shit the bed. You're going to set the message text to something. And this one says no, no, no deleting the log data. Because mm. you shouldn't be seeing this unless you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing. Um, and then it ends. So what this does when you you signal this SQL state of 45,000 means this is a fatal exception. So it's sort of like, you know when you were doing the uh, the permission stuff and if, if you experimented at all when you created the different permissions and you went to delete something and it says you're not allowed? <laughs> this is essentially what this will do. It will raise saying you're not allowed to do this. Um, you can use signal states for all kinds of things. Uh, often if you are writing a code and the business logic is embedded in the database because you should never pro uh, trust the front-end developers as a database guy. Um, you should always uh, do some basic checking. Oh, the end user set the price to zero for something. He's going to give it away. That's a no-no. You can raise an error so that when they go to do an, ups an insert or an update, and they're setting the price to zero dollars, it's going to say, dude, no. Um, you can use this to actually do fancier math. You can see if the price is, the new price is less than, say, 80% of the original price, that means they're allowed, maybe allowed to do up to a 20% discount. You can actually make it raise errors based on logic and let the database manage the rules. Um, that's the last slide, but there's a bit more that comes behind this. Uh, some of the logic and the decision making for slideshows, then for triggers, decision making for both the slideshows and the triggers. Screen gone. Um, when you use triggers, there are some specific advantages to using triggers over programmatic code. Uh, advantage number one uh, database maintenance 
the if you write code to maintain your database structure as in to clean out orphans to delete child records that kind of stuff to delete related records that the front end may not know about often the front end code has to run multiple queries to achieve this for example we have an order and we're killing the order order is canceled we don't want to keep a copy of it if we want to delete the order and depending on how you designed your database assuming the person that designed it didn't know what they were doing let's say you have uh, the order you have the child table which is the order details uh, there might be a, a notes table where you got notes for each of the order lines it might be notes for the order itself etc cetera, etc cetera. so let's just say the order table order lines two tables worth of notes and then another table for for add-ons so five tables if you want to delete one order you got to issue five queries and you got to wait for all five of those to succeed and you got to run them all as part of a transaction block to make sure that you don't have leftover data if you do it as part of the trigger you go delete order where ID is equal to 55 bang done the before trigger runs deletes all the child records from, uh, in the correct order everything is gone cleaned out and that's done and over there's two advantages to that one the performance gain is significant uh, we're talking 20 to 30 percent better performance minimum for that kind of stuff um, two the data logic is stored inside the database which means that in the future somebody comes into the code and they say oh we need to add a new table to this order process so then you create the table you add it and then you update the trigger so that the table is taken care of so at that point you created a table and you modified code in how many places one you modified the one trigger on the other hand now you've got an application that has a desktop client a web client and say an iOS client or an, or an Android client so you got say four different clients you got to deal with it and for some unknown reason none of them are using web-based technology they're actually com communicating with the database directly you have to modify the code at all four of those places if you're doing it the traditional way and not only that that means you got to go through a test cycle then you have to go through a deployment cycle that gets kind of gross right for maybe a table that serves no other purpose other than maybe keeping track of some behind the scenes details temporarily uh, which the front end code would never see but because you're not using triggers and you're doing it all in the code the code needs to know what's there so that's one of the advantages of using triggers it's self-contained it's contained inside the database server um, some other purposes for triggers people use logging obviously as those who are doing trigger uh, lab 10 you've experienced it already you're logging user changes uh, one of the examples on the slideshow which slideshow should be on blackboard on canvas I mean it should that that shows also a different kind of logging um, there you can actually do business logic so that means um, an example of that would be a complete process where you inventory allocation that would be one which is what I'm using as my example next week because that's actually a pretty big uh, chunk of example um, you can use it for uh, rules for example MySQL doesn't support check constraints it's there you can add the code to your table creates it ignores it because it doesn't support check constraints if you want to create rules that says oh these fields have to have certain values you have to use a check constraint but you can't use a check constraint that means you have to use a trigger instead you'd use a before trigger to make sure your data is valid so well, I'm going to do a few examples of some basic triggers and then then we're going to wrap it up All right, so that's the same table we I was playing with last week. Now, let's just say we're going to go with like such. And let's say we want to 
well, let's create a new rule where a person is not allowed to be paid less than X amount of dollars because we're nice people. We don't have free interns because actually that's against the law in Canada. So if ever you get a job as an intern, they're not going to pay you. If you're, over, if you're over 18, they have to pay you unless they're a political party. All right, now. Uh, well you can use double dollar signs, you can use, shoot. Uh, you can use double slash, you can use anything. Uh, you could actually go tilde delimiter, tilde if you wanted. It doesn't care. Um, double dollar sign, because that's just the one I'm used to using. I've used double slashes in the past. Um, like I said the pa before, double dollar signs acted weird on Macs. And it acts weird if you're using PHP my admin. But if you're using Workbench, it works just fine. Okay, so I'm going to create a trigger. Then you give it a name. And I just lost my mouse somehow. Okay, here. Somewhere. Okay, I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it um, now this one here, the, the uppercase lowercase isn't as important because it's not something your end users interact with. It's something that is um, that's run automatically by the system so it's okay to actually use your happy camel case business now uh, for this. Uh, but you can all do it all lowercase too, it's fine, whatever you want. Um, And I just lost the ability to see my screen. Okay. So we can go like this here. Before update on. Is that the right order? Yes. Okay. I was writing Postgres triggers yesterday, so the syntax is a little different in Postgres. That's why I was kind of having a hesitant moment going, is this right? Okay. Oh. So we're saying if the new salary is less than $10,000, we're going to raise an exception. And since I'm really, really lazy, I'm actually going to copy paste it. And that's going, eh, that's still good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to raise an exception and it's going to say salary must be at least like such. Um, Actually, I can put in a, something in here to make it look more serious. You know, there, make it look, make it look professional because that's important. Okay, and I'm going to run my trigger, and actually we've got a couple of problems here. Bring back my delimiter. I'm going to run this. No error messages. I'm going to update my employee. I'm going to go run. And there's my validation error. Salary must be at least $10,000 right down here. So it's, an, it's a built-in controlled error message. 
Let's see what I can do. Oh, piss off windows. That's probably as good as I can make it. All right, so. Now, we're doing a validation and a check on this. That's great. Yep, yeah, so we're using a trigger for checking the salary. Um, but I'm a big, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of these if, if it exists because not all the servers support it. Um, so I'm, I've gotten to the habit of go, doing long form because you know until recently we didn't have if exists. So those just are a little old and crusty. We get like we get lazy that way. Now we can do a salary check. That's great. We can do if salary is greater than is less than ten thousand. Signal state that. We can actually do. I mean, let's add a new condition in here. If new dot salary is greater than or equal to old dot salary times one point. One point one. Before I write my error message, can somebody tell me what what the logic is? What I just did. If the new salary is greater than or equal to the old salary times one point one, let's put brackets on that so that it's more isolated for your uh, reading pleasure. Yeah, in other words, person should not be allowed to have a 10% or higher raise. Right, a bit, unless you work for Bombardier or Phoenix. Apparently you can have, you know, 45% raises and bonuses. Um, so this is a, another check saying you're not allowed to give someone a raise greater than 1.1%. I mean, I mean 10%, 9%, 9.999, 9 like, you know. 0 0.9991.0999999 is allowed. Um, there's just to avoid people getting salaries that are too big. Um, let's just say we had a column in there that said, oh, if this particular column is set, then it's allowed, as in salary override was allowed. Then we could add an extra piece of logic on this saying, oh, the salary override was allowed by such and such. And I'll make, I'll do that after. So I'm going to go do this. I'm going to run the whole shooting match. Uh, trigger does not exist. Mm, oh, did I already run that? Yeah, I did, didn't I? Okay, there's the salary. It must be, you know, greater than that. Let's go grab our... Um, our salaries from the employees. Oh, and let's go equal to salary times 1.20. So let's give this person a 20% raise. Um, and I have a mistake that didn't change my message. Uh, salary increase too large. So now I gotta redo the whole thing again. Execute. Trigger already exists. Of course it did. Why? Try it again. There's the salary increase too large. So I'm adding some rules right down here. I'm starting to add some rules. Yeah. No, it threw an error because I I the trigger already exists and I didn't drop it. I had a I had a brain fart. Oh, the SQL states you can return these as different kinds of levels of error. You can return 45,000 is an error, a fatal error. Uh, I don't remember them off the top of my head, but there's one that's a warning and one that's an info. So you can return debugging messages out of your trigger. So as you're testing a really complex trigger, you can return information level messages. So these are messages that aren't returned as part of the record set, but it will show up down here as in info items. That way, at least you can test your code and see what's happening. You can also use 
uh, signal state with the lower ones and actually send up like the equivalent of doing a, you know when you're learning Python and you do print commands to print out your variables as you're testing your code? Obviously with triggers, there's no breakpoints. You can't stop your code and walk through your code like you can in C Sharp or PHP or Python if you've got your environment set up right. So the only way to really check if things are working is to print out values. So you can use various different levels of SQL states. The info level, which I don't remember what it is, I'll look it up in a minute. Uh, but you can use different levels. Um, Postgres, for example, has something called raise exception, raise notice, raise warning, raise log. So it has diff just the, the word it uses after is different. And it's more obvious than 45,000. Uh, basically, you end up having to look it up and see what the different levels are. Uh, so we have a salary increase that is now too large. So we're going to create one last entry here. Alter table employees. Add column. Salary. Override. Did. By. We're going to make that a var car 50. So I'm going to add a column to my table. And I'm going to modify this one here. If new salary is this, and new dot Is my logic right? Yeah, I think that's right. We're going to find out in a minute. So we're going to rebuild everything. And... Uh, update salary already equal to that. I'm going to change the ID to 2. And I think my code is busted. because it's allowing it to happen and it shouldn't. And this is where Dan goes and looks up the error states. <laughs> hey? Well, that's the question. I got to check what's inside the, that block uh, and I need to output it. So. Um, we signal. Try that again. Of course, I can't read the error message. Value of no. So yes, you're correct. So we turn this to that. Rebuild the whole thing. Salary increase too large. My trigger is now catching it once again. So let's just say I decide to go, and we call this uh, that. So now we're going to run this trigger and hope it works. <laughs> 
no error. Well, they gave me a warning. Uh, the warning's to be expected because when I multiplied it by a percentage, it was too many decimal places for the numeric. So it truncates the number to two places. And suddenly I've got a trigger. Let's see if I can make this all fit in one screen. Um, this is a check and straight type trigger. So in other words, um, we create a trigger. We check see if the salary is less than a set amount. That way we can't have crooked HR employees. And then we're making sure that people can't have a big raise unless somebody overrides it. And if it's being overridden, it's going to log who overrode it. If it's not being overridden and somebody tries to give somebody too big a raise, the system catches it and says, not allowed. It's a fairly straightforward trigger. Uh, the concept is, well, obviously, it is what it is. Um, there shouldn't be uh, much to say past that. The only other kind of trigger is the one you're, that's common for simple level triggers like this, is the, the other one you guys are doing for lab 10, which I've got an example on the slideshow, which is a logging trigger. Um, now, some other uses you can have for triggers. If your database support server supports it, which in this case, MySQL doesn't support some of these features. But Microsoft SQL Server and Postgres, for example, I'm pretty sure Oracle does also. Um, they have what they call, what's called untrusted triggers. A trusted trigger is a trigger that is self-contained sandbox. In other words, it's in a little room. The little room's called the database server, and it can't operate outside the database server. An untrusted trigger, which kind of sounds funny, right? Because you don't trust it, so you're going to let it play outside the sandbox. It means it's running code that could be damaging to the system. Um, you can actually use untrusted languages to modify file system uh, objects to make calls to another server. Um, for example, Postgres has language called PL Python. So Python-based triggers and functions. And I used a trigger to update a database, a different database server. So we had something called dongles. If the dongle changes, and a specific piece of the dongle that changes, it actually opens up an RPC call to another server. It's a bit like a JSON call to another server and tells it, this just updated, here's the new data. So I've got real, the two systems are keeping themselves in sync real time using triggers. Uh, because it's untrusted, that means that it's able to reach outside the database server and manipulate something on the outside world. Um, one of the biggest issues that people have, especially for websites where you can upload files, is when you delete your file, often the developers are lazy. They delete the database entry for the file, but they don't delete the file. What they do instead is they delete uh, the entry in the database, and then they, there's a routine that runs once a day or every once a week, and it looks through the database for all the files that exist, and then it compares to what's on the disk, and then it deletes the ones it doesn't find on the disk so that they can improve performance. That, in other words, they just didn't want to trust their PHP scripts or their Python scripts to actually screw with the file system. Fine. But with these other triggers, you could actually get, oh, file is deleted from the database. Let's fire the untrusted command and actually go right at the disk and delete the file off the disk immediately. What does that do? That does three things. Uh, number one, you only needed to issue a single dead delete command. Um, now, for example, I, you guys haven't learned PHP, I'm assuming you've learned Python. I know in PHP, if I want to delete a file, what I have to do is, first I retrieve the record to find out what the file name is, grab that, then I delete the file. If the record deletes successfully, here's the cache, right, deletes successfully, it then um, reaches out and deletes, builds up the correct path and deletes the file off the disk. But here's what's weird. Let's say that delete fails. The record's gone out of the database. Or let's turn it around and go the other way. Let's delete the file off the disk first in case it fails. 
and then we'll delete the record out of the database, and then the delete for the database fails. Now the file is gone, but the record's still in the database. There's logic issues, right? So at this point, you have to write all this code with, well, I'm going to take this file, and I'm going to move it off to a safe spot temporarily. I'm going to delete the record out of the database. That succeeds. Then I'll delete it out of the temporary spot. That's a lot of code just to delete a file. On the other hand, you write a trigger. You do it before delete trigger. Delete the file. Oh, I can't delete the file. Raise error. There you go. The before delete never happened. Um, if it successfully deletes the file and the database record still fails, you still cut caught in that race situation. But at least you're handling half the logic right in the database. And in theory, you could actually write the trigger to do the same thing. Take the file, move the file, delete the record, then do an after trigger to actually delete, to nuke the file. But that's all self-contained, and the database developer, only, the, the, the front-end developer only needed to issue one command, as opposed to maybe needing 10, 12 lines of code to do it. He needs two lines. Generate the SQL command, execute the SQL command. The database is self-maintaining. The database project is self-maintaining. Kind of cool. Uh, like I said, MySQL does not support that with um, these kinds of triggers. Um, you are able to do this, though, that kind of stuff with it if you're willing to learn C++. Uh, then what you do is you create an extension, a new kind of plugin. Like, you know how you create your own functions using this language? You can create a function written in C, and then you'd call it as part of the trigger. You do the trigger that calls the C function and then modifies the disk. Uh, it's convoluted and painful. Uh, for a Microsoft SQL server, you write your trigger using tr uh, untrusted C sharp. Magic. Uh, you write your, you create a DLL, you call the function from the DLL, magic files are gone. And you use all the standard functionality you're used to as a Windows developer. And it, it works. Okay, now, um, I did one of those, I did, you guys know what the logging is. The, um, so, you know what's happening next week, because apparently we're already done. That went quick. People aren't asking questions, so I gap the middle for questions and there's no questions, I can keep going through. Um, next week I'm going to do a long set of triggers. So I won't be doing the presentation thing here. Hopefully the projector is working right this time, by this time next week. Um, and it's going to be a set of triggers for inventory allocation. So I'll have to explain the process of how inventory allocation works. And then I'm going to do the review because, you know, what happens after next week is exams. Since we're doing class exams. So at least that's what I was told to do. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, so that's, that's about it. Um, as it is, just enough information about triggers to try to absorb. It's not logic you've never seen before. Uh, also next week I'll introduce you to the concept of cursors, um, which is you run a query inside of a trigger that's being run inside a query. So you have a query and it fires off a trigger. The trigger has something called a cursor which is actually another query that's running inside of it. So you're running a query inside a query. It's a little bit of an inception moment. Um, and then you can do stuff magically, which I will introduce the cursors when I do the inventory allocation because those things go hand in hand. Um, other than that, uh, does anybody have any questions about what I covered today? This, because I'm updating two columns. I'm updating the salary, okay. and I'm marking that it was overrided by someone. Um, if I were to break it down to multiple rows, it would look like this. Like that. Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to post this trigger right to Canvas in just a second so that you guys have an example of a, um, a check style trigger. Um, one, of the per one of the other perks of going, doing this is um, that, like I said, it helps you avoid things like check constraints that 
MySQL doesn't support. And sometimes you have database servers where certain database servers have certain features and other ones don't. For example, Postgres has check constraints. MySQL does not. Postgres has domain, uh, data domains, which means you can determine data must be inside this range or must look like such. MySQL doesn't support that. What you can do, if you write an application that supports multiple kinds of database backends, of course, the database structure is different because they have different data types. You actually write your triggers for each of the database servers. That means that the application logic doesn't need to know about the particular quirks of each database server. You let the structure of the database take care of including the built-in triggers. That means you've got to write triggers in every database's language, whatever they happen to use, but at least the logic is not outside the database server. So all said and done, there's less maintenance because you bring it in, the triggers are in place, rules are happening. And you just code it for each of the different applications. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Don't believe Access. Access is full of it. No, what's happening is Access doesn't understand the concept of in-class exams. Uh, you guys have probably had this problem with Jerome's classes already where his exam is scheduled during the last week of the term. Yeah, some of them are, or at least level one ones were. And I've been told that one of his other classes is scheduled during the last week of class, not during the exam week which means it's less load on you guys during the ex final exam week. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be just like you did your your, 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 your two midterms. It's the same setup. Just ignore access, it's full of it. I will be sending out announcements applicable. Yeah, you just got to find out which courses you actually have exams for. Well, the, the, the trigger the trigger one is you have basically two labs to do it, even though it doesn't take two labs to do. Uh, this week's lab and next week's lab. And then the practical is the week after. Well, you do if, you've, if you haven't finished it. If you finished lab 10, Obviously, you don't have lab next week. If you didn't finish lab 10, you've got lab next week. So. All right. <laughs>